Hey everybody, this is Alexander Fitzgerald, or Assassinato, doing another one of my free presentations for Jonathan Little. Uh, today we're going to be discussing 3-betting out of position, my new toy. 3-betting out of position. This concept is fun because I still see a real aversion to people wanting to do it. The big blind 3-bet is comically misunderstood these days. People believe it has to be a strong hand. It's as if people are thinking they would call with all their mediocre hands, so why wouldn't you do that? This opens a pathway to representing a strong hand when we don't have one. In today's webinar, you will learn how you can combat people who keep raising your big blind and make a lot of money doing it. It's important to learn this because every time we play tournament poker, people are going to attack our big blinds. That's their job, right? I'm going to show you the way to re-raise their ass and show them who's boss. Brief introduction, for those of you who don't know me, I, I know a lot of you do know me, so I'm going to do this really quick because I've done a lot of these. For those of you who don't know who I am, here is a brief introduction. I turned pro in 2006 when I was 18 years old. I haven't had a real job since, which is really great because I was a fisherman before that and that job really sucked, so I'm really happy to be doing this job. Uh, I have WPT and EPT final tables along with WCOOP and SCOOP wins, which again beats security jobs like I used to do working at an Arby's, which I used to do. Uh, so yeah, I'm very happy to be doing this job. Uh, more importantly, I have taught more private poker lessons than anyone on earth. Of course, I'm just guessing on that point, but I'm fairly sure that's right. I've been coaching privately since 2007 because I think it's a good idea for any professional to have other streams of income just due to the unpredictable nature of poker. I found out early on that I actually really enjoyed coaching, so I stuck with that. So really happy to be with you guys here. I really like my job, very happy to be here, yada, yada. All right, let's get you playing cards. So, so when it gets folded to you here on the button, you open, right? 10-6 suited on the button. Uh, you raise, big blind calls. The board comes whatever it is and you see bet. Why? Why do you normally see that? Because normally he has nothing. You want the pot to be over with. Your hand is vulnerable. A lot of overcards to a six. And why do you check here if you do check? It's because you know most guys will fire one street as a bluff, but that's it, right? Just one street. Now, let's look at this situation. What are you doing here? Somebody raises on the big blind. You're both very deep. You have 10 six suited. Let's see, everybody in the questions, tell me what you're doing here. You're calling, you're raising. I bet. And it looks like a lot of people are honestly saying if somebody raises them in the big blind, they're, they're probably going to call. Now, you can... Uh, a call is correct, but so is a raise. A raise can be too, and truthfully, I do three bet here quite a bit. It's difficult to teach though, because big pots out of position can be very dangerous, so we're gonna make sure we have some specific plans if we're gonna try that. But we need to do both if we're going to be an unpredictable player. This is a great time for a three bet because we have a mediocre flopping hand and our opponent is unlikely to four bet at this stack depth especially now, it's gone out of style. So let's say we do three bet here. Guys, I want you to think of all the live games you've played in the past year, the early levels. Does anyone fold your three bet here? Now, if you gruffly said no, ask yourself, why is that a bad thing? Pop quiz, hot shot. He calls. The board comes jack of hearts, five of hearts, four of clubs. What do you do? I'm going to give you guys a little time on this one because I want you to think about it. Type in the chat are the questions. So we got a few people for B. We got a couple people for D, option D. Uh, let's see. C. And we got a couple for A all over the board. Okay, so we're, you know, a lot of, most of you guys just answered, so we'll go right there. So it's all over the board here. Isn't that interesting? 
The truth is you can actually make every play work here. So you're all right, but I think the people who are, well, I don't know if they're the most right, but the standard play should be two thirds pot. Like let's just say you're sitting down at a card room, you don't know anything, you should go for two thirds pot. Let's say you see that into this board. What range is he on? How often does your bet need to work? Well, remember, he flats you with damn near anything he opened. That's a lot of hands. Notice how he doesn't have a pair or draw 46% of the time. So something I notice when I play live, even online, where people tend to be a bit more disciplined, but not too much if it's American facing, is I raise there, and I don't think the 9-6 suited is going to the mock, nor is the 9-8 off suit, especially if we're very, very deep. And that creates an opportunity because here, he doesn't have a pair or a draw 46% of the time. If you fold out a high card, you're golden. Even if he calls you with his gut shots, he's still folding 46% of the time. If there's an option I hate here the most, it's the half pot bet because ask yourself this, is he folding ace of hearts, 10 of clubs to half pot? I don't know, that's the problem. No one knows. One third, he's probably calling with a ton of high cards. Two thirds, not many people do that. Half pot, who knows? One third is interesting because you can get him to call with most of his high cards and then fold turn. That's a riskier play, but it is more profitable if you can pull it off. I don't mind check raising here 10 to 20% of the time either. I do that generally versus jumpy younger players who will check back ace five on this board, but will bet whenever they miss. So that makes their range very much just garbage. Uh, and also guys, the reason it's important that the guy doesn't even have a gut shot 46% of the time is if you bet three fourths the pot, let's say, that only needs to work 42.8% of the time. And usually when people look at a very large bet, say three fourths of the pot, it, they'll usually just, at least with their high cards, they'll muck, right? Maybe with a gut shot, they'll think about it, but at least their high cards, they'll let go. And that just set us up in a very profitable endeavor. But in my opinion, so going back through these options, because I find this hand utterly fascinating, I think a check raise here 10 to 20% of the time is really fun versus young guys who just think a check is a green light and they have to go for it. Betting one third pot is very interesting too because you could get a bunch of high cards to call you that'll fold on the turn. So it's a riskier play, uh, but it can make you money. Uh, betting bigger two thirds pot, three fourths pot, I think is very cut and dry, but it, it's profitable. The one that I worry about the most is betting half pot. Betting half pot is the biggest leak out of position in my opinion because two thirds pot needs to work 40% of the time as a complete bluff. Three-fourths pot size bet needs to work 42.8% of the time. This will usually fold down high cards, which is going to be most of his range on most boards, but half pot I'm not so sure about. Now, if you are gonna bet big though, what boards though do you wanna avoid? What boards do you think are bad for you when you three bet there? The easiest way to remember this, it's not a perfect rule, but two cards nine or higher tends to be a pretty bad board. Most guys flat three bets with mostly high cards, some middle cards. A board with two cards nine or higher is all over that range. We need to hit the brakes on that board. This is really interesting. Look at this next slide, guys. Notice how if we just make that five from the previous board a nine, he now has a draw or better 73% of the time, okay? So I'm including gut shots there because people tend to hang on a little bit more with gut shots that make big straights or they call more with gut shots and broadways because they look with broadways because they look more impressive. But if we remove the 12% of gut shots to the player, still the player still has a pair or a great draw 61% of the time. So if he defends with those hands, he's only folding 39% of the time, which means the bigger bets are no longer an option. That makes it harder for us to use a larger bet to force them to fold high cards and gut shots. We're very much compromised here. And this is a weak to high card board. It only gets worse as we change the big cards around. If we make one of those cards an ace, for example, we're just screwed. 
uh, tens are also pretty bad. Now guys, I want you to look at something. This was the range you were betting into when he flatted your small three bet in position. In position. This was the one he had when he flatted from the big blind if he was a tighter player. Look, okay, again, this is his three bet flatting range. This is a big blind flatting range. That's a little bit more discipline. There's not that much difference between the two. Why is setting up the three bet then C bet so bad, but the first one is so standard? For fun, let's change one thing. Let's say you flop a pair here instead of completely missing. What do you want to do here? This one's a little more difficult, so I'm going to give you a touch more time. Tell me in the questions. One person just said B, another person said D. A lot of people saying B, a few people saying A. Oh, and I guess <laughs> my little my little timer's having trouble there. All right, time's up, guys. It looks like most of you got an answer in there anyhow. Let's give you, I'll just give you a second more. What would you normally do? Okay, so let's go on. Just pick one because it's, a, it's good. This is how I found I learned much more actively was just challenging myself. I would turn training videos off and see if I could, uh, the audio off to see if I could, uh, guess what the next move would be or I would pause them frequently and that really saw me deliberately practicing as opposed to just passively watching it's not the hours you put in it's what you put in the hours so uh, you can check here just like you might have done in that first hand a uh, bet one third pot bet half pot bet two thirds pot that's more or less cashing out your equity it's almost as if I'm bluffing <laughs> Uh, I just happen to have a six in my hand, which is still a profitable move, but obviously not the most calibrated because the problem becomes with most of these bets on the turn, we're stuck, right? And then what happens is if we check, we tell the guy what we have. Now, if there was a time to check, I think 10, 20% of the time that should be a check raise. Obviously a certain percentage of the time that should be a check fold. Uh, if you just completely bomb the board or the guy for some reason you think is just really not folding your C bets. And then a lot of the time it should be these mediocre pairs because there is something that kind of saves us. If you checked here in the first hand when you were uh, in position, why do you check here? It's because generally the second barrel is honest. They bet the turn as a bluff but not as so much the river. Many guys will fire turn but not river as a bluff. That's even more true in three bet pots at low to mid stakes. The double barrel is honest. In three bet pots, generally, the double barrel is honest. People play a little more honestly in three bet pots. It's not a perfect rule, but less than a third of players can fire a double barrel bluff in a three bet pot. That number goes way south if it's low in mid stakes. Most guys take one shot, look at the size of the pot, and go the hell with this. You can also bet on this flop. Generally, if you bet out of position, you should be prepared to fire three streets. If you check at any point in the hand, you tell the other guy you have a pair. That said, many low to mid stakes players won't do anything about it in a huge three bet pot. You just have to trust the second barrel and pick up the pot the more majority of the time when your opponent misses. So what happens is, is we are generally assuming our opponent's going to miss and our opponent's going to fold, right? And if our opponent misses and we check, usually they'll fire one barrel. And then if they check the turn, fire river, that's almost never a bluff. And if they fire the turn, it is going to be a bluff like 25 to 30% of the time. But there's not a whole lot we can do about it out of position. And the way we lose all of the money that we make three bets C betting is just by playing these ginormous pots out of position with one pair, calling down, praying for the best, having no idea what we're doing. If you want to filter out how people bust in tournaments, it is staggeringly often that it is one pair out of position. The guy didn't know what to do, so he just clicked call to see what happens. You, we want to avoid that as much as possible. Now, 
one caveat emptor here when you're doing this, guys. Targeting is everything. You should not three bet everything from the big blind. Don't go losing all your money out of position and blaming me. The best time to do it is when you're playing a knowledgeable reg who opens too much in position. If you have a tighter image, he'll usually flat your three bet and fold his high cards. That's all we need. So it's something you should bring in there sometimes. That 10-6 suited, you can absolutely flat with that hand. You can flat to set up a check raise, or you can even play a little tighter on the flop. That's okay, but what you want to do if you think the person is likely to fold a high card, and maybe they've gotten a little comfortable opening into your big blind because you've had to fold a couple of times, and perhaps you have a tighter image uh, just because you haven't played many hands or people ascribe you a tighter image you don't exactly deserve because you're a senior citizen or a lady, you can use that image because people will overestimate what your three bet from the big line has to be. Uh, just because most people tend to flat with the entirety of their range out of position, when they see somebody three bet from the big line, they think, well, if I would flat an ace jack there, that's got to at least be an ace queen. And that's what we're taking advantage of when we three bet C bet. Out of position with nothing, if the board has two cards nine or higher, you should probably hit the brakes. If the board has one high card that's not an ace, you want to bet a little bit more than half pot to get high cards to fold. If the board comes ace high, you can do a small one third pot bet because he either has the ace or he doesn't. Out of position with a pair. The problem when you're out of position is if you stop betting at any point, you have told the guy you have a missed draw or a pair which is really bad when you have a pair. People tend to play pretty well when they know what you have. Look at your pair at the beginning of the hand and ask if it's likely to remain the top pair throughout the hand. So if there's no draws on the board, it's really likely a pair is going to be very valuable by the end. If you have an ace or a king, that's really likely to remain top pair by the river, obviously if it's an ace, right? But a king or a queen or something along those lines. Now, if you have that six, like we had in this example, that's really not likely to stay even second pair. So you don't want to lead, check the turn, let the guy know what you have. You can take a more cautious route here and be okay, even if a quarter of the time he bluffs you, because 70%-ish of the time he's not going to. Now... If you do have a hand that is likely to remain top pair due to lack of draws and the high ranking of the card, if the answer is yes, bet whatever you want and keep betting. If your hand is not that good though, let's say it's a mediocre pair and you just think checking's not really a terrific idea because the guy is reacting to you most of the time when you're betting, but he's a bit of a gunner if you give him the green light, you can actually structure your bets thinly say 30%, 30%, 40%. That's a very old cash game style play that I used to use a lot, which was I would be playing in a cash game where it was more recreational players. And let's say I three bet because I, I, I was out of position, but I wanted to play a bigger pot with the guy anyway because I thought the guy was so easy to interpret and I had ace 10 or something. And the board came queen 10 too, well, I didn't want to scare the guy away, but I didn't want to check at any point and let him know I was weak. I could just go 30%, 30%, 30%, and the guy would usually call me with eights all the way down, or 10-9. Now, that play is a little face up, uh, but the question is, is anybody going to do anything about it? If you're playing 2-5 cash in Vegas, somebody will do something about it. If you're at 1-2, most likely no one will. In tournaments, people really are resistant to raising, it, especially if you bet. Well, in tournaments, 30 to 40% is more or less standardized. So they don't think of that as, hey, I better raise this willy-nilly. It's very difficult to find somebody who will raise a pair for value too. That's one of the hardest things to teach someone. People have a real problem raising as a bluff post flop. I know because I've been trying to teach it for seven years and no one wants to do it. And it's really, different. it's really difficult to find in the data as well. And the reason for that is pretty obvious when we think about it. If you can imagine, have you guys ever tried to bluff at the table and then gotten caught? 
what was the look everybody gave you? It's like, oh, look at you trying, like, har, 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 look at you, egg on your face, what's wrong with you? Even in online poker, sometimes people will write things in the chat. Well, most people experience that two or three times. They go, I don't like this. I better call with my pairs to allow them to bluff me. Uh, even though there are times you should raise with top pair because the guy's just going to call with anything. Or people just generally will think, well, maybe this is a good spot to raise, but the last few times I did it, it didn't work, and that really hurt my feelings, so I'm just not going to try it. Limit decisions out of position. Most pots you want to play out of position should be small, and they should only take place on the flop. Position doesn't matter when you shove 17 big blinds pre-flop because you're only playing that one move, for example. It's close to the same thing if you make sure you only play pre-flop and flop. Positional disadvantage is only as pronounced as the number of streets you'll play. Now, we got to talk about something before we wrap up here, guys. How most people mess this up, I need you to pay attention to this really clearly. The way most people mess this up is they three bet a few times, chop out a few pots, love the play, and then one day they flop a pair. They C bet the flop, and then on the turn they don't really want to get rid of it, so they check call the turn, they check call the river, and then they give away the tournament and they never want to three bet out of position. Again, if you don't know what to do, fold. That is true for all of investing, as it is in No Limit Hold'em. If you don't know about a particular business, if I say I want to open up a Six Flags imitation theme park somewhere in Nebraska, you're probably going to tell me you don't want to invest with me because you don't know anything about Nebraska, real estate, theme parks, or me as far as a business person. It is the same thing in No Limit Hold'em. If you do not know what is going on, you do not invest money, okay? I hate to do it, but... Four or five times a tournament, every time I play cash, multiple times, I will get to a spot where I think someone's putting one on, but I can't really do anything about it. The guy got me, right? But the key is, it's much like golf. You want to make sure your mistakes are the smallest. When you're letting go of something, it's seven big blinds. When they're letting go of something, it's 70. But you got to chop out the little pots if you want to stay competitive, especially in tournament poker. Now... In this particular scenario, they could have just check folded turn and waited to chop out another pot. So remember that. <laughs> By the way, I just want you guys to know, once in a while, a guy will call your large C bet with a high card and beat you. It happens. Uh, it so On occasion, somebody's just going to beat you. Kobe didn't sink every one of his shots either. This is a very exploitative strategy that tends to work versus most people, because let's be honest, most people like to fold their high cards to big bets, especially if they don't know who you are. I have to play a little bit more balanced and engage in more GTO stuff because people know who I am, but no one's going to know you saw this, and you should play that up at the table that you're not into poker. I always jokingly say, Wear the Titleist hat when you show up in a polo shirt. Dress up a little bit when you go play poker. Poker players, quote-unquote poker pros, always want to show how little they're trying. So it's always the basketball shorts and the sweaters, right? If you dress up a little bit and don't shuffle your chips and ask some questions to the dealer, they won't know you're putting them on when you three-bet them. They're going to give up at least the high cards. Online, this tends to work too. I recently challenged a student to three bet 300 plus times uh, out of position as opposed to flatting and doing it with hands he wanted to flat before. So three bet out of position, I filtered out all the really good hands and, uh, you know, hands he really liked to flat before and uh, stuff like ace four suited. Technically, you can flat with, of course, but let was trying to get him to three bet a little bit more. He got results that look like this by, I'm going to say this slowly, targeting only halfway decent players who probably fold high cards post-flop, but were opening too much pre-flop. So let me say that one more time. He was targeting only halfway decent players who'd probably fold high cards post-flop, but were opening too much pre-flop. 
When I run this experiment, this is usually the results I get. As you can see though, no one wants to do it in the big blind, uh, even though it's just as effective because it's so tempting to flat bear, which is why all the examples in this demonstration were from the big blind because you should also be three betting the small blind quite a bit too, but I wanted to show it's possible from the big blind where everybody feels religiously they have to call now. All right, that's it for my presentation today, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, let me go into the chat. Now that we're done, uh, do you mind if I tell you about a special offer Poker Coaching has? Uh, type one in the chat if that's okay. Thank you for all the kind words, everybody. Wow, okay, you guys really like this. Okay, I see a lot of ones. Well, allow me to tell you about something. The reason we're <laughs> able to do this. I have a special offer for you guys in regards to poker coaching, where myself, Jonathan Little, and Matt Affleck work. PokerCoaching.com, what is PokerCoaching.com? PokerCoaching.com has over 400 interactive poker hand quizzes, over 30 coaching challenge webinars, four new hand quizzes every week, and you get to attend a live coaching challenge webinar with two-time WPT champion Jonathan Little every month. Uh, guys, just speaking off the cuff here a little bit, when I was coming up in poker, creating hand quizzes was very difficult. I would have to watch training videos and pause manually and kind of have to guess what they were trying to do and things like that. And to actually have quizzes where you can deliberately practice 400 of them, that is a godsend. That is unbelievable for your development because it gives you time to think about other options, I know personally, I really love doing the hand history quizzes, making them myself. I've, I've had the opportunity to make about a hundred of them. And it's really fun because you get to throw out a bunch of different options and say, if you tried this option, this line could possibly work. If you tried this option, I don't like it because of that. And it gets you thinking about poker in so many different ways and deliberately opening your mind. Whereas sometimes, I know when I used to watch poker passively on TV, I wasn't engaging myself nearly as much. So 400 interactive poker hand quizzes, that's the thing that really pops off the screen for me. You also, you get access to floattheturn.com for free. Pokercoaching.com now includes access to floattheturn.com. With your free floattheturn.com uh, membership, you get access to 786 poker training videos covering sit and goes, tournaments, and cash games. That's over 400 hours of poker videos to stream on demand or download for offline viewing. That's really sweet. Uh, you'll have to access, you'll have access to floattheturn.com for as long as you're a member of pokercoaching.com. And you can also get up to 10 free videos worth 970 for free. So yeah, a bonus of 10 free poker training videos worth $97 each. That would be with 50 reward stars, which would be added to your account. You can browse the training videos you can redeem with your reward stars at pokercoaching.com slash rewards. That, email, uh, that uh, website address, one more time, is pokercoaching.com slash rewards. Now, this stuff is crazy. What you're gonna get if you get the three-year option, 400 plus interactive hand quizzes, uh, at five bucks a pop, that's a $2,000 value. 30 plus challenge webinars, so 30 times $29 a pop, that's an $870 value. Four new quizzes every week for three years, so that's 624 new quizzes at $5 each, that's a $3,120 value. And you get to attend a live webinar every month for three years. 36 live webinars at $29 each. That's a $1,044 value. Bonus number one, 400 plus hours of training videos on floattheturn.com, which would be $10 a month at 36 months. That's a $360 value. And 10 free training videos, which would be a $970 value. The total value of all of that is over $8,000. It's $8,364.
Poker coaching would normally be $39 a month, which is, if this was available when I was coming up, like $39, I'd be jumping all over. But at 12 months, that would be $468. Uh, 24 months, $936. And at 36 months, that's $1,404. But right now, that's slashed down. Uh, in, for 12 months, it's just 199 And for 24 months, it's just 249 And for 36 months, instead of $1,404, it's $299. You can learn more about that at pokercoaching.com slash lucky. Use that coupon code LUCKY to get everything for just $299, the total value of $8,364 for $299, pokercoaching.com slash LUCKY. Thank you guys for tuning in. I really appreciate your time, and I really appreciate you allowing me to discuss this deal. I'm here to answer any poker questions you may have, so let's go ahead and look into questions. Somebody asks, how do you keep your composure when you're running card dead for hours? Uh, generally, I try to remember that it's really nice to be playing poker in an air-conditioned room. And it's just really wonderful to be doing that. Mike Thompson says, thanks a ton, man. Everything you say is solid gold. Going to upgrade my membership right now. Thoughts on three betting hands like Queen Jack suited and live one, two cash from the big blind. I put a hand history up on two plus two and caught a lot of crap for not calling and taking the hand four ways. It does, uh, it does work as a flat out, but uh, it's, you can squeeze there if your opponents are likely to fold a little too much and if they are playing too many hands. And if you get a number of folds preflop, that really justifies it. And if you can get it heads up with one person and you think they're calling a little too much. So generally what I like to do is, uh, generally what I like to do is when there's somebody who's just kind of goofing off at the table in live cash and just calls a little too much, I really try to isolate that person if I find other people are trying to uh, just call all the time. Mike asks, am I right that you can do this with any two big cards? Um, no, uh, you cannot do it with any big cards. You do want some flopping potential when you do this. How do you like to play your premium hands from the big blind? Well, if I'm heads up, Michael, sometimes I will call and check raise the flop because many people won't assume that I would do that with a pair. But many times I do three bet as well because especially if you've been very active on the three bet, you are going to need to balance that with some bigger hands. Uh, Brandon asks, can you three bet suited one gappers? Yes, that is very much true. I love three betting with suited one gappers. <laughs> Someone asks, uh, not hearing the dog in the background, is he okay? Uh, I unfortunately had to give my dog away. Did not like, my dogs did not like the small uh, New York apartments. Dan says, I play small stakes one, two to two, three, where there are a lot of limpers. Would you ever take this line after a lag raises from late? Uh, I love re-isolating uh, legs that ISO raise a lot, but you do need to know that the early limpers do not do that with big hands. So typically, you're, people tend to get known for that in the card room, so I wouldn't do that right away. But once you know people do, don't limp in with big hands, that, then you could start doing that. Joey says, would you teach your students to three bet balance or are they going to bluff heavy because it is a good spot? Um, I generally don't introduce this move that quickly with my students, but then I bring it out if they've really mastered all, all the fundamentals and I tell them, uh, and I do tell them to bring it out on occasion.
Uh, does it matter which blind? I do tend to like to do it more from, uh, I, I will work in a lot of flats with check raises and donk leads and stuff like that uh, from the big blind and won't three bet nearly as much, but from the small blind, I do three bet quite a bit. When raising, how do you account for limpers and big blind annies in your sizing? Um, the big blind ante is just the same as a normal thing. But uh, when it comes to, when it comes to limpers, I just tend to add another two, 2.5 X to it as far as big blinds. When there is a raise and a call before it reaches the big blind, I assume you don't three bet unless you have a good hand, Michael asks. Well, I will squeeze there usually to about 6.5x uh, what the initial open was, plus 2.5x for each additional limper, just assuming a raise and a call. Uh, but I usually do that when I know the first guy is just raising with everything and the other guy just is trying to catch him and is calling with everything and I just try to crap on their party. Am I seen as a maniac at the table? Yeah, typically. Typically, I am. Functional maniac, someone says. If you three bet the big blind and the original Razor four bets, do you fold? Yes, Jeff, I do. I tend to. Somebody asked for exact percentages. I don't balance it as much. It's usually you try to time it just when you can tell somebody's opening a little too much, but is one of those players that will fold a high card. What if it's a min four bet? That's a terrific play, Dave. I actually really like that, but a lot... Of, they kind of just have you at that point. That's usually somebody who really knows what they're doing, so I would just get out of there. How much should you three bet from a big blind? 4X? Well, a good, if you're setting up a C bet bluff, Michael, uh, the three bet that you tend to want to do is one that will keep in most of their opening range, but would be a little expensive for them to four bet. All right, guys, I just have a couple more minutes, then we'll be out of here. You're welcome, Brian. I'm really glad you enjoyed the webinar. Luis, thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> Jeff says when he wins the 50, he'll give me a shout out. I, I hope you win it. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, James. Thank you, Mark. Wow, okay, it's coming really fast. Thank you, Will. Very kind words of yours. All right, guys. I'm going to I'm going to head out. Thank you very much for tuning in. I really appreciate your time. You guys have a great night or morning wherever you are.